Greetings folks, it's Professor Fiore, and in this video we are going to talk about phase splitters one more time, this time using an op amp. So let's take a quick review if you haven't seen the other two phase splitter videos. What's a phase splitter? It's an amplifier that takes an input signal and produces two outputs. These two outputs are generally identical except for one thing, and that is their phase. One of these is in phase with the input, the other one is out of phase with the input. In other words, these two are 180 degrees out of phase. Otherwise, they should have the same gain, same frequency response, everything else should be the same. This is used in a differential configuration where these two signals go out through a twisted pair coaxial cable. This goes into a differential amplifier on the far end. And the idea here is that any noise that's induced in the cable, whether it's hum, a transient noise, whatever, will be induced in phase. The differential amplifier, of course, takes the difference between the two inputs. So as those signals, those interference and hum signals are induced in phase, we have two identical signals. They should cancel perfectly and we get nothing out. But the desired input signal, right, they're in anti-phase. So, for example, if we had sine and minus sine, we'd have sine minus a minus sine, which is two sine. We get a big output signal, right? So it doesn't do anything about the input noise, but stuff that comes in on the cable, because, you know, you might have really long cables, for example. This is very common in professional audio. You might have a really long cable. So we want to minimize any induced noise because the microphone signals themselves are going to be pretty small. So characteristics of our ideal phase splitter. The two outputs that are in anti-phase with perfectly matched gains. It should have a high input impedance and a low output impedance right on both of these. That would allow it to tolerate an unbalanced load. So by unbalanced, we would mean that these two input impedances wouldn't be the same. Now, very often, you do have balanced input impedances. That's the norm. But there are cases where that's not the situation, and it's good if the amplifier can deal with that. All right. Obviously, it needs to have an appropriately wide bandwidth and low distortion. So when we looked at some of the other options, if you were, we looked at one version, the very first one in the Semiconductor Devices playlist, uh, where we used a single transistor that was sort of a combination of a common collector, common emitter configuration. And that worked reasonably well, you know, especially considering its simplicity. It was really no more components than a, a simple common emitter amplifier. Yet you got a gain of just under one, just under unity. It was nicely matched. Uh, we had reasonably low distortion, an appropriate frequency response that was all good. Downside, well, the output impedances were not matched. One was a high value, the other was a low value. It would not tolerate unbalanced loads, and one of those loads actually helped set the input impedance. So, not so great. Then we moved off to a differential amplifier version, which solved some problems. For example, the load didn't affect the input impedance. That was nice. It had really great matching, good distortion. Um, the output impedances were matched, but unfortunately they were both high. They were both large. You could solve that by putting on some followers, but now you're looking at five transistors. All right? Both of those had to be capacitively coupled at the output. So, you know, they weren't directly coupled. So that's also a strike against them. Still perfectly good circuits, though. They work. But now it's time to look at something a little different. We are going to use some operational amplifiers. Here we go. So I'm going to run this on a standard plus and minus 15 volt power supply split. And um, I'm using two TL071 op amps. Now, you know, you have a lot of options on the op amps, and uh, you know these are nice bifet op amps. They're quite old, actually. I mean, these this design was out in the 1970s. Um, they still work well, but you can get better devices, lower noise, lower offset, certainly. 
Um, if I was doing a brand new design today, I, I probably wouldn't use them. You know, there's other choices, but they are widely available. You know, if you wanted to prototype something, um, they are inexpensive. And one nice thing for this application is you can get duals for these. You can get a TL072 that has two op amps in one eight pin mini dip package. So, you know, if you're going to breadboard some of these kinds of things in labs, that's really convenient. Very similar to this is the TL082 and the 81, that series. They're also available in quads, uh, 7.4s and 8.4s. Um, another uh, very similar performing op amp is the uh, LF351, and it's dual the LF353. It also has a quad, which I think is the LF347, if I remember correctly. Um, so they're, they're contemporaries. They were designed around the same time. And they all have very similar performance characteristics in terms of slew rate and noise and so forth. Uh, and then, you know, you could get a, a newer generation, for example, um, an LF411, which, again, has similar sorts of uh, AC performance characteristics, like, like the uh, slew rate and the gain bandwidth product. However, it has vastly improved DC offset. So, you know, that's more along the lines of something you would use for a a newer design. But in any case, you know, let's see what we actually have going on here. There's a couple different ways we can configure that, configure this. The way I've done this here is in a unity gain format, and we basically have a buffer sitting out front, right? So this is unity gain. This is a um, um, series parallel negative feedback, and we just have a single wire going back. This sets up our gain, you know, to unity in, you know, Really, it's like 0 0.9995 or something like that, but it's it's one, okay? And then what we're doing here is we're going to drive one of the loads directly. So this just buffers whatever the source is. That goes out to load one. And then we also tap off of that a second op amp, which is set up as a unity gain inverting buffer. So the gain for this would be RF over I inverted. In other words, what I've got is 10K over 10K. So that would be a gain of minus one, all right? Over here, you know, if you're wondering about the equation, RF is zero and RI is basically infinity because it would be sitting over here. So you just get the one. So you have one and one, right? Ultimately, this depends, as, as far as the matching on the outputs, this depends on the matching of these two resistors. If you can get these tight, so you could use some precision metal film resistors, for example, um, you can get these in, you know, very, very tight and get uh, gain matching between these two outputs beautifully. Now, you could also tap, instead of tapping here, you could tap out here. In other words, have the generator drive this and this directly. The nice sort of result of doing it this way, of, of just running the, the uh, non-inverting buffer here, is that you can easily adapt this into a a version that has gain, that has forward gain. And uh, that is shown here, right? So all I've done is just thrown in the, the proper values of RF and RI. So in this case, this would be RF of 10K over an RI of 2.5K plus 1, right? So that would be 4 plus 1 or 5 for a gain. So you have the input signal. We would get 5 times that at the output. That goes directly to VLOAD 1. And then it goes through the second op amp with a gain of minus 1. So we would also have that same boosted signal out here, right? If you did it the other way where you were tapping off the front end, then what would end up happening is you'd also have to set this thing up for a gain of five. So now you've got four resistors to play with. So, you know, I think it's better off if you do this. Now, as far as the overall set of performance characteristics that we were talking about, right? You know, the, the input impedance and the gain and all that stuff, right? We're just sort of remind what we're looking at here. Um, certainly we have the two outputs. We can get a, a very, very tightly matched set of gains that are greater than one if we want. Um, what about these other things? You know, I think we can say at this point that we could get wide bandwidth and low THD if we uh, um, used appropriate op amps, right? You know, you need, need to get a good uh, F unity for, for a wide bandwidth. But even the devices that we have, those are like three or four megahertz devices. So <laughs> you're gonna have plenty wide bandwidth. But what about the unbalanced loads and the input and output impedances? All right, so I'll go back to the original one here. 
Well, certainly it's going to have a very high input impedance because that's going to be set by this, this buffer. Now, th this particular op amp, like I said, is a bifet. It's got a JFET diff amp on the front end. So this is crazy high. You know, this is a, a, a megadi million ohms coming in here, all right? Certainly at low frequencies. Now, what about the output impedances? Well, both of these things, using negative feedback, have effective output impedances that are a fraction of an ohm. These things are great. So if you, uh, if you want to drive unbalanced loads, I have balanced loads here, 2K and 2K, um, it's really not going to be a problem. And you can have a 2K and a 1K, and you're still going to get really good gain matching. So this really seems to have everything that we want. Oh, yeah, one more thing which is no coupling capacitors, right? So this thing has a performance, frequency performance goes down to zero hertz, DC. It's directly coupled. Great stuff, all right? And, you know, there's, a, there's even one more thing. Let's just add one more little thing on here, and that is if you are so inclined. Sometimes you need to have a very specific output impedance. It's not a, enough to have a low output impedance. Sometimes the thing that you're driving wants to see, you know, looking back, a certain output impedance. And that's really easy to do here because since these op amps with feedback have such a low output impedance, you can just add a series resistor right here. All right, and you put the same resistor over here. So, you know, for example, if you needed a balanced 200 ohm output impedance, you just grab a couple of 200 ohm resistors and you're good to go, all right? So that's not something that, uh, you know, you would need to do all the time, but if you do need to do it, you have that option. So this is pretty much everything that you need, okay? You are limited by the power supply as far as the swings, as far as your com output compliance is concerned. But, you know, let's, let's take a look at what's, what's actually going on here. Take a look at the transient response first. Okay. So... Open this up a little bit. And where is my, here we go. Okay, so uh, VGen here is olive, which we can't see. Why can't we see it? Because it's, you know, overlaid perfectly on one of these. VLOAD2 is the maroon. So, you know, we can see that we're getting the, the nice zero cross here. We're getting our one volt input. Um, you know, right here, it looks good on the, on the transient response. I imagine we could kind of like zoom in and try to find VGen, but, you know, actually there's a little trick. We might, well, I can't really see it. Maybe we could zoom into it. Ah, there you go. So <laughs> they are right there, right? You know, they're, they're right on top of each other. Okay, so let's check out, now that we have that, let's go check out the, um, the Bode plot, the AC characteristics see what we get boom look at that dead flat all the way down to dc well it's going to say dc technically it's one hertz but you know really nice we're seeing a little bit of a, a split off over here at the very high end so we might ask hey why is that why is load two which is coming off the inverting amplifier right that's coming off this one this is load two move this out of the way so you can see it right so load two is coming off the inverting amplifier. Why is that peeling off early? Well, if you haven't hit it already, when we look at frequency response, inverting amplifiers do not have quite as wide a bandwidth as non-inverting amplifiers. Noise gain on an inverting amplifier is the same as signal gain. For um, the inverting amplifiers, the noise gain is uh, one unit larger so when we divide the gain bandwidth product by the noise gain, we only get half the bandwidth for the inverting type. And that's really what we're seeing out here. All right. But, you know, as long as um, that upper break, this F2 out here, is high enough, you know, if this was an audio application, this is way more than high enough. You know, we only need to go up to, you know, 20-ish kilohertz. And this is looking good, right? You know, minus three is out here somewhere. We're over a megahertz, even with the narrower bandwidth on uh, op amp number two. So this is looking really, really nice, okay? Low distortion, wide bandwidth, um, as wide as the op amps anyway. 
very high input impedance, very low output impedance, handles those uh, unbalanced loads if we have them. It's capacitorless, right? So it's DC coupled. Beautiful stuff. And, you know, to make it even better, we can get a dual op amp to do this, right? So it's really nice stuff. Um, you know, what are your, what are your limitations here, right? You know, is there a downside? Well, um, like I said, you are limited by the power supplies. You could design a discrete circuit that has a larger output swing. Of course, you could go out and spend a little bit more money and get op amps that run on higher, higher rails. The same thing is true for maximum output current. Um, generally though, as long as, you know, as long as you're within those sorts of uh, output swing limits, this would really be the hot ticket using one of these. You've got the best performance overall, and it's, it's uh, certainly price competitive, okay? Even with a, uh, uh, a nicer op amp than your sort of very common jelly bean op amp, all right? Beautiful. So that rounds up, uh, winds up, excuse me, the uh, uh, third part, third installment in our uh, face splitter trilogy. So if you have any questions, I think you know what to do by now, right? Ask down in the comments. Have a good one, and we'll be seeing you later.